Okay, so in the last class, uh, we started looking at what is termed as uh, single stage amplifier. And under this, uh, we have three types. One is the common source, the other one is the common gate and the common drain. Okay, so now again what we did is that uh, we classified this common source amplifier under two categories. That is basically purely based on your structure. Okay, so based on the structure, we had something known as a simple uh, structure or a simple CS amplifier. The other one is, uh, what is the structure? Source degeneration, right? Yeah, CS amplifier with source degeneration resistance RS. Okay, so these were the two structures that we had and both of these structures have been mapped here. Okay, so these are the two structures and the difference between uh, both these structures are the resistance that I have across the source. Okay, otherwise both these structures are uh, basically a common source amplifier. Yeah, so now again uh, under this particular common source amplifier like, like simple structure we had uh, further different types of loads, right? The first load that we discussed was residue load, okay, RD, and the second load was about the diode connected, and the third one is about to start, like, hope that I will start today with this current source load, and the fourth one is the triode load, okay? So these are the four different loads that we will discuss across this CS amplifier and see their drawbacks, and uh, basically we, we started with this uh, residue load and then uh, we moved on to the other type of loads here. So what was our main requirement here? So when I say, uh, when we tried designing this common source amplifier, we posted uh, some sort of requirement, okay? So our first requirement was the gain uh, to be high, okay? So that was our first requirement. The small signal gain, we wanted to be uh, as high as possible, okay? So in order to have this, uh, what we did is that we, we just went on with the residue load and we found certain uh, drawbacks in this. So what was the drawback in this uh, small signal gain? Yeah, so uh, the gain was actually equal to GM times RD, okay? Now, since because there is a direct relation between this GM and RD and this GM in turn depends on our VGS, okay, or the Q point, what happens is that any variation in this Q point would then disturb my gain as well, okay? So there is a kind of direct link and we want to break this link first of all. And is there anything else that we are, we are concerned about this? Apart from uh, having this uh, shortcoming? Uh, yeah, we also discussed about the voltage swing. Right, uh, but I don't think that is a kind of issue. But the point is that what was the voltage swing that we had for this? What was our VO max and what was our VO minimum? How did we found these two uh, phenomena? Yeah, correct. So say for example, I have a swing around this particular node, uh, across the output node, and for which, first of all, I need a base, okay? Which is nothing but the Q point at the output. So what is the Q point at the output? Uh, how will I define this uh, base value? Yeah, so it is VDD minus capital ID times RD. Okay, and how will I get this capital ID? It is by fixing a DC potential across the gate. So again, I'm just fixing my VGS Q here, and then I'm trying to establish a current, and that current is purely DC. And now that, what happens is that when I try to introduce a small signal, a small wiggle, uh, this one is is clearly a small signal which is labeled as small VGS and that wiggle will actually add up some sort of current and this current can flow in both the cycles like uh, both positive and negative cycles okay so I'll just put a kind of modulus across it just to uh, yeah modulus is not proper uh, but in the sense a small signal will, uh, current would flow okay so now because of this uh, this current that is flowing the small signal current what happens to the output voltage over here, it varies, but this variation is happening just because of the current that is flowing through the drain resistance, am I right? Because the current has to flow across this ID, so the product of these two things has to create some sort of wiggle around my base point, okay? So whenever there is a positive peak, obviously it will lead to some sort of negative uh, swing and whenever there is a, a a negative swing across my input, this leads to a positive swing across my output. There is an inversion or inverting amplifier. And this is what we have learned. 
And uh, one of the questions that I uh, ask is, like, what if I'm trying to increase this amplitude of this VGS, such that these swings are being stretched all the way to the bottom and all the way stretched up all the way to the top. Okay? Still, my transistor has to stay in the saturation region. So what is this minimum value that I can reach and what is the maximum value that I can reach here? Yeah, so that answers my VO max for the top one, which can reach all the way to VDD. What about this guy? It's supposed to be VOV. Now, why is this supposed to be VOV? Is because across the drain and the source, if I want to make the transverse to be in the saturation region, what is the minimum voltage that I need to put across the drain and source of this M1? Yeah, VGS minus VD. So, my VGS minus VD is fixed. Okay. So, my VDS can be more than this or what is the bare minimum voltage that I can have such that even my transfer is in saturation. It is my VOV level, right? So my VDS can be up to this, but if I go below, below this particular VOV, then my transfer would be entering into linear region, right? So, so the minimum voltage that I have to have across this drain to source is supposed to be my VOV1, okay? So I'll just put this number just because after this, we'll be uh, dealing with lot many other transistors, so due to which I'll start using the numbering. And appropriately, I have to label here as well, like GM1. It is not to be called as just GM. Yeah, so these are the things that we have seen in the last class. And later, uh, in order to combat this particular issue that we had, that is, the gain is directly dependent on GM, or in turn, it actually depends on my Q point. I want to eliminate this kind of uh, dependency on it. So what we did? Yeah, so we replaced this guy, RD, with a diode-connected configuration, right? So now, uh, apart from this, uh, the other structure that I didn't mention is that, is this is a, what type of amplifier that I've plugged here? Amplifier, CS, CD, uh, CG, CS only, right? So, so how, how did you found that? Yeah, the input is to the gate, and where I'm taking the output? from the drain, okay? So please make sure that you identify a, uh, this structure, okay? And one more thing that I just want to emphasize is that we call this device as a kind of input device, okay? Where I'm feeding my input, that particular transfer we will call it as an input device, and whatever I connect across this magenta color, we call it as a load device, okay? So that could be a resistor or it could be a transistor, whatever it is. We call this guy as a load, okay? And generally we call this transistor as an input device. Clear? Yeah. So again, this is nothing but the same CS amplifier with source degeneration resistance at the top. Okay. So RS is here, and this could be anything. Okay. Yeah. So now that we just move on to. Uh, okay. Yeah. So all of these stuffs I've already discussed. So this is supposed to be my VDD. This is the maximum voltage, and this is supposed to be my minimum voltage, which is supposed to be my VOV1, and uh, this is the amount of swing that I can have have across my VDS, where VDS is nothing but my V out itself, okay? So, yeah. So, having done this, uh, now what I do do is that I try to replace this resistance with a diode connected. So, again, we have two type of diode connections. Uh, one is something like this. Okay. Uh, so, where, where I have used a PMOS, okay? And I also have NMOS. Now the question is that, uh, is this kind of structure is possible or not? That, that is what I just wanted to uh, ask here. So, okay, uh, I think I just had some plan, but uh, I didn't uh, really execute it. So, can I use this structure such that can I? use the drain to connect to the drain of this M1 transistor. Over here, what I've done is that I've connected the drain of PMOS. Can I be able to plug in this particular place to the drain of my M1? It's possible. So this structure is fine. Having this structure, is it fine or not? Yeah. So what about this guy? Here in this case, I'm trying to connect the source of my M2 transistor that is replacing this magenta uh, color. Okay with the drain of my M1 transistor. Can I connect this source and this drain together? Is there any problem with this? No. Okay. So what about this guy, wherein the source is connected to the ground and uh, the drain getting connected to the drain of this M1? No. 
okay so these are not these are all invalid because i've seen uh, people writing all these kind of structures okay so do not use something uh, where i have an nmos and trying to connect the drain to the drain of this m1 that is not possible okay so please ensure those those kind of things for this nmos m1 it is not possible but what if if i have the other structure where i have my v in here okay and i have some uh, sort of load here now that for this load i just want to fix one of the uh, structures can i still fix this load over here it is not possible you have to think for it to answer okay so what are the structure that was feasible for this is not applicable when i go for this kind of structure so please be aware when you are trying to plug in any kind of load that lying to your cs amplifier okay if the input device is an nmos then only these two loads are possible if the input device is a pmos then this kind of loads is what you have to use it here okay so i have one more structure which is i think uh, yeah pmos with this both connected to the ground and this source terminal could be connected so so how will i differentiate so these two structures are applicable only for this and these two structures are only applicable for this kind of structures so please be aware of these things uh, which we will use it to twist your uh, brain during your exams okay so that's the reason yeah so now that having said this uh, we also found something interesting about the circuit right so uh, what type of uh, structure we used basically for in the last class is it 1 2 3 4 which one i used uh, to get some sort of gain expression we used 2 hope that you remember it okay so i used this nmos i didn't use this uh, pmos yet uh, i i will just hold this pmos for a while okay but i just used this guy and uh, we derived some sort of gain expression out of this right so what was the gain expression that we got uh, when i used this structure in the place of this load okay so our capital gm always depends on this input device right so due to which what i had was just gm1 right uh, but what about the load yeah so when i look down i'm looking into the drain of m1 due to which i would get a resistance value of r1 but when i look up i'm looking into the source terminal of my am2 transistor and due to which what was the load of this uh, like resistance 1 by yeah gm2 in parallel with gmb2 okay in parallel with ro2 all of these resistance values would then combine to create this whole of uh, values okay so i'll just put ro2 and i'll write this one as gm2 prime okay which is nothing but the summation of gm2 plus gmb2 okay now in order to have an insight what i said is that let us assume that the value of lambda for both the devices are taken as zero now in that case what happens to this ro1 and ro2 infinity it is not zero okay so when you have something small in parallel with infinity effectively you will get only the infinite value sorry or effectively you will get the small value right so so due to which i can cancel out these two things and that would end up something like gm1 by uh, gm2 prime okay now we can write this gm2 prime as something like gm 2 into 1 plus eta right so what we had was uh, gm1 by gm2 into 1 plus eta factor is what we had okay now again i was emphasizing on one particular uh, thing is that what type of gms i can use in order to uh, apply over here so i have three forms of gms yeah so 2 id by v o v and square root of uh, 2 id k n dash w by l now among these three forms one of the form never fits here the first one why yeah the one thing is that uh, none of the parameters are common to both or uh, nothing is flowing across them nothing is being shared across them both this m1 and m2 but what is actually shared is the current so what are the current that flows across this m2 is actually flowing even across my m1 as well so i have to pick the equations where the currents are same so if i look for this expression there is no current equation in this 
okay so i cannot use this guy but when i look for the second and the third i could able to see that the current is available so i i have to use only these two expressions in order to substitute for this expression of gm1 by gm2 clear so when i do so i would end up with two different answers uh, plugging in the second one would end up having something like vov2 divided by vov1 and uh, for simplification uh, i would just assume that eta is equal to 0 just for the simplification but we will come back to this and we'll try to solve that as well okay so i have this expression and when i adopt this uh, third one the third expression i would end up having something like w by l of 1 divided by w by l of 2 so these were the uh, two different gain expressions that i have got uh, so we'll, again i will not discuss about any of these gain expression until otherwise we look back into our large signal so why do i need a large signal uh, uh, plot what is the need of this large signal uh, analysis for anything uh, one would be the current i can get the current value yeah but what else what did we uh, how did we found uh, our vo max and vo minimum we used yeah we we generally use the large signal plot that could be uh, v out versus v in or using this id versus vds also we could be able to get those values right so we generally in need of a large signal plot whenever we want to measure the vo max and vo minimum right yeah so now that i've just plotted a graph of id versus uh, vds for my transistor one okay so this is for m1 so i will this is my m2 and uh, I have this M1 where I have this V in and I have my V out. Okay, so this is what I have, and uh, what I have plotted here is the graph that corresponds to M1. Now, how to extract this uh, output swing? What did we did before in order to get the uh, output voltage swing? Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, when I vary my signal of uh, VGS, uh, we were trying to. Yeah, so but uh, finally it ended up with some sort of line, right? So in the case of a residue load, RD, this residue load appears as if some sort of line like this, right? So this helped me to identify my VO max as well as my VO minimum where my transfer is in saturation. And that is how I predicted. So what do we call this line as? Load line. So whenever there is a load line that intersects with this cara, I can extract the value of VO max and VO minimum. And that is for sure. But the point is that, how do I plot the load line? Just because we had some sort of expression uh, for the residue load where uh, yeah, VDD minus ID times RD, I use this equation to plot it actually. Correct. But now that I have something else, I don't have a simple resistance, but rather something which is what have we found yeah so, so some might argue no no i know the resistance and what was that resistance you would argue it is 1 by gm2 prime parallel with something but all of those resistance are small signal okay but i'm working with a large signal phenomena right now i cannot use those and that is applicable only when i'm in the saturation and the signals are small changes okay i cannot use those uh, 1 by gm or r not values here so do not get confused with that as well okay so please be aware of it so i cannot use that so now that i am like a kind of don't know what to do so yeah current yeah so how will i use that yeah so i can so whatever his idea is if i know what is the current that flows here with respect to some variations then i can do it so now that i uh, I can actually equate the VDS1 to be exactly equal to V out. So I have this plot, which is basically uh, the x-axis is plotting my V out. Okay. Now, how will I measure the current that flows uh, across this node is by reading out the VGS value, right? Okay. So the current ID2 with respect to VDS is what I, what I wanted, okay. But we also know 
how is this VDS is related to my VGS of my second transistor? Are they different? Uh, what if I'm trying to plot the same kind of graph over here for this M2 transistor? Will I get a graph something like this? Okay, whatever graph then I will get. You see, uh, I've just taken this node and I'm I'm doing something with it. Okay, yeah, a yeah, parabola. Okay. One thing that you have to observe here is that the value of VGS and VDS are same. Am I right? Yeah. So if you have that knowledge, rather than writing like uh, ID versus VDS, I can still write as ID versus VGS too. Now, since because it's a uh, N MOS transistor, how will I get the graph? Yeah. So we know that something till VT, when VGS is equal to VT, will I get any kind of current? No, so I won't get any current till this particular point. After then, yeah, it shoots up something like this. Okay, but the point is that is this VDS2 is same as that of V out as we had it for uh, VDS1? No, there is something different, right? So what I have to do is that I have to expand this VDS as something like VD minus VS, right? Now what is my VS? It is V out. So I have V out here, but what is connected to my VD? It is my VDD. Okay. So, so I cannot merge these two uh, x-axis graphs directly from here to here. But I need to some I need to perform some sort of changes, right? So I have to map this x-axis from VDS to V out. How will I do that? Okay, yeah. So, say for example, I want to map this particular point onto this graph, right? So, in this case, what was my VDS value? It is equal to zero. So, I substitute that value over here. The corresponding value that I have here is actually zero, so that I am substituting here. So, I have this formula. So, what it defines for me? So, V out is equal to VDD. So, this point is actually getting translated to this particular point here. Am I right? Right. So let us take this particular point. I have my VDS, which is equal to VT. Now, how will this VT point will translate over here? Yeah, the same thing, right? So if I plug in, uh, like just by interchanging these two things, I would get something like VT here. So now, is this value, suppose we plot it towards the right or towards the left of this graph? Towards the left. Now, am I getting any current? No. So, I cannot jump to the top line. I have to stay in the same line where the current is equal to zero. So, due to which I am plotting the second or this particular point over here as something like VDD minus VT. Okay. So, and after then, I think you can easily predict how the graph would look. So, this graph would then go something like this. Okay. Now, this line that I have drawn would act as a load line. Am I right? Yeah. So now having this as my load line, how will I measure my VO max and VO minimum such that both the transfers are in saturation? Now the point is that before I address this, whenever I have a diode connected transistor, how many regions of operation it has? Only two. One is cutoff, the other one is saturation. It doesn't have any linear at all. So this graph, throughout this entire segment, I have my M2 staying in the saturation. There is no problem. But a structure like this, an input device like this, how many regions it can operate? Three. Okay. So we have to be aware of it. So now, uh, let us split this entire graph into uh, segments. Okay. So here one segment, and over here one more segment. Clear? Now in this first segment, my transistor M1 is in which region? M1. M1 is in saturation, but M2 was in cutoff. Okay, so I cannot use this region. Why? Because whenever I try to measure my VO max and VO minimum, I said n number of transistors it can be. All the transistors has to be in the saturation. So I cannot use this region to measure my VO max or VO minimum. Okay. What about this region? So in this case, 
I find that both my M1 and M2 are in saturation. So let us move to the final region. Okay. So in this, what is happening to my M1? Yeah, M1 is in linear and M2 is in saturation. Okay, is it all clear? Yeah, so there was some murmuring uh, just because of some reason. I got to know oh, what is that murmuring. When we discuss about this, I think some sort of uh, doubts that you had in your mind, right? Over here? Ah, of course, of course. I'm just trying to tell that uh, how to measure basically. Uh, so in order to measure any kind of output swing, I have to ensure that both the transistors are in saturation. Okay. But what is the load that you will use for it? And the current, you see, in this case, uh, what happens is that the DC current will will be ultimately stops. So you cannot do anything with it, right? Yeah. So. Now let us try to mark these extreme points. So how will I measure my VO max? What is the VO max for this uh, particular structure? Where my M1 and M2 are in saturation. Yeah. So VO max in the sense I have to go towards this end and I get able to see that this is the most extreme point at which I have both M1 and M2 being in saturation. So that particular point is nothing but VDD minus VT. Okay. So I can write my VO max as VDD minus VT. And what about the minimum? So minimum in the sense I have to go towards the uh, leftmost segment of this. Okay. What is the minimum value? VGS minus VT of which one? Of M1. You see, there is an intersection point here. Okay, and that in intersection point is the region which separates linear from saturation, right? So I just have to intersect a particular point. Okay, so this is nothing but my VOV one. Or in another way, if you are not clear like how exactly we are writing it as VOV one, I could still use this particular plot in order to discuss that. Okay, so I'll just erase few things in order to have some room such that I can discuss uh, with some sort of graph. Okay. Uh, now, whole of the story has to be uh, uh, fruitful, right? So, if at all, if I want to draw any swing, I have to know what is the base value or the uh, output Q point, right? So, can you tell me what is the output Q point? Who is defining the output Q point? VDD minus VDS2. Uh, VDD minus VDS2. Do you all agree with it? or VGS2, both are same, right? Yeah, so both are same and <coughs> both these graphs would then appear something like this, right? So say for example, I have a corresponding value of VGS2, uh, if I fix this as my Q point, then I would get some sort of current and that current would match to this particular line that I have drawn, okay? So it doesn't matter. So the base point is basically defined as something like VDD minus this VGS2. Now why I am concerned about this VGS2? Two. The moment you fix a DC value here, which is VGS1 Q, it defines a capital ID. Now, if the same ID has to flow across this M2, it has to have an appropriate value of VGS2, right? So, in other words, if I assume that both my M1 and M2 are identical, even in terms of aspect ratios, then what would be my VGS2 then? It would be equal to VGS1 itself because both the currents has to be equal. Okay, so so that's all fine. So this is written as something like VGS2. Okay. Now I have this Q point, and now from this Q point, I am just going to add a wiggle. Now this wiggle, in turn, would get translated to the output through all the small signal and stuff. Okay. Now what happens whenever there is a positive peak here across my input? It gets translated as a negative swing. Now when I am having a negative swing, what is happening is that this voltage that I have is trying to reduce the value of VDS1. Now how far the VDS1 can go down? 
till VOV1. Okay, so the VDS value can be till this particular point. It cannot go below this value. Otherwise, my M1 will enter into linear segment. Clear? So that is my uh, minimum voltage that I have. What about this guy? So again, I'm trying to increase. Okay, so there is a, a negative swing here to the input, and this negative swing is actually translated into a positive swing at the output. Now, how far I can go? Yes. So I have to have a threshold voltage between these two regions, right? So this is nothing but VDD minus VDH2. Is, is it all makes sense? Yeah. Hope that uh, you people are clear. But I'm not that much satisfied just by looking at your faces. But still, uh, I have to go ahead. Now, from this graph, I have to actually translate to uh, V out versus V in, right? So that is the uh, ultimate aim. So I'll just try to draw the V out versus V in. The graph is as simple as what we had before. So I have my V in and I have my V out. And uh, when the value of V in of this device is equal to VDH, what would be my V out? So it is basically a translation from this graph, ID versus VDS graph, onto this graph. Okay. So the whole point is that when my VN is falling between 0 to VDH, that is the M1 transistor VN. Okay. So when the VGS value is equal to v, VDH, is there is any current? No current. So what's supposed to be the value of this guy? Uh, v out. VDD? VDD minus VDH, right? So this is the topmost value that I would get. There is a maximum value that I would get out of the circuit. Since because there is no current, it points to this location. Okay? So due to which, what I have is, I will be staying in this VDD minus VDH throughout this entire segment till I reach the value of V in that is equal to VDH. But after then, what happens? It would drop, am I right? Yeah. So obviously it has to drop, and this drop is almost linear. It is not uh, too much of curvature that we had for our residue load, but it is almost purely linear. And now, why this is more linear when I am in the saturation? Again, we have to get back to our gain. How was the gain was expressed in the? Yeah, GM1 by GM2 or in terms of uh, W by L factors. So, whenever the transistors, both the transistors are in saturation, the gain is constant. Alright. So, obviously the slope of the line has to be linear. When I am in the saturation, there is no problem at all. Okay. There is no change in the GM. Okay. That is not affecting me anything here. So, in that case, what happens is that I will have a very straight line and there is a particular point. Let me call that particular point as V in 1. Okay, at which my transistor reaches or, or the V out reaches my VOE1. And after then, the graph will have some sort of non-linearity just because my M1 has got into linear segment. Okay, so in this case, the M1 is in linear and due to which I have a non-linear behavior. Okay, whereas here, both M1 and M2 were in saturation. And in this case, M2 is, is still in saturation, it doesn't matter. Whereas here, my M1 and M2. Yeah, so now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I said uh, you people were murmuring for something. I just hold it, but nobody had asked actually. Now, what I said here, was it right? No. Both M1 as well as M2 are in cutoff. Okay? Why? For M1, throughout this entire region is considered as cutoff. I am I'm still along this x axis. I have never jumped above this x axis value. Okay? So, both this M1 and M2 are in cutoff. Okay? And this entire segment of line that I had 
where y equal to 0 or id equal to 0 is considered as cutoff for m1. Okay. So I think we had already discussed about it, but I will not repeat it again. Okay. So we'll just go ahead with it. Okay. Yeah. So in a way, uh, I found when I use this kind of transistor being m1 as n MOS and m2 as p MOS. Sorry, n MOS. We had the gain that is defined as gm1 by gm2, and uh, there is an eta factor. Now, uh, is this eta is a problem for us? Yeah, why is that? Uh, yeah, it might reduce the gain, but the point is that uh, is it a constant value, eta? What is the expression of eta? Okay, uh, I think gamma divided by 2. You people have to tell. Square root of plus Vsb. Okay. No, no, that will not be there. That will not be there. Okay. Yeah. So, whole of this issue had happened just because my transfer M2 source was not at the same potential as that of my body, right? Yeah, so, so now that I have this read the value of VSB for this M2 transistor, so when I split this VSB2 as VS2 minus VB2, obviously it's an NMOS transistor due to which the VB2 is at zero, but what happens to my VS2? That is at V out. So now whenever there is a swing around this particular node, what happens to this V out? That changes. That in turn changes my gamma value. Now is the relation or linear or non-linear? It's a purely non-linear. Okay. Just because I put it under the square root and it is 1 upon square root, it introduces a very non-linear error. Okay. So how will I rectify this uh, error? Or how will I uh, get, get rid of this Nonlinearity. Connect body. What if uh, if I am trying to replace this M2 with a PMOS transistor? Uh, let us try. Uh, yeah. Yes, of course. So the solution to this uh, issue to eliminate this nonlinearity from the gain expression is to replace this M2 with a PMOS. Right, so the structure would then get translated something like this. So I have this PMOS where both the source and the body of the PMOS are all connected to VDD. There is no potential difference due to which there is no body effect from my M2 transistor. So if that is the case, what is my uh, gain? Just in a simple word, I have this M1. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is what I am expecting, but nobody else is telling. Uh, probably I have to tell that lambda has to be considered as zero. Okay. Yeah. So are you clear with this? Okay. So somehow by replacing this transistor M2 with a PMOS, I could able to step down to this result. Okay. Now let us try to apply the GMs. Okay. So I have two forms of GMs. Uh, the very first form is square root of 2ID. So when I plug in, what I would get is something like, am I right? Yeah. So in this, uh, this mu2 is nothing but my PMOS, right? So I have to write it as the mobility of my PMOS transistor. Now, one could actually argue that for larger technological nodes, which means that uh, we are talking about transistors whose minimum length is more than one micron. In that case, one could ap approximate this to be, uh, or the mobility of the NMOS could be approximated to a value of twice the mobility of our 
n mos, right? Sorry, p mos. Okay. So if I do so, then I could reduce this equation to be something like uh, where do I put? Right? Yeah. So now let us talk about the drawbacks. Okay. So what we have done till now is that we somehow had eliminated the issue of uh, the gain being dependent on the q point. Okay. So this is the expression that I have got. And in this case, nothing is dependent on anything, even nonlinearity is not there. So we are happy with it. But now that I am asking for you to design an amplifier whose gain I needed to be 10. Now, how does it impact my uh, design? I need, yeah. So the W by L of 1 supposed to be 100 times, 50 times greater than the W by L of 2, right? Is there any problem with this device? Okay, can we go, go ahead for this? You see, you have a disproportion, a load being a very small and uh, the input device being a very large device, okay? So there is a disproportion between the PMOS and NMOS, okay, between the load and the input device. And apart from this, uh, is there any other issue that I can figure out? A disproportion uh, structure we have. Point number one. Point number two. What happens when I try to feed uh, some sort of signal to this structure? Any driver would then seize a very large capacitance, right? At the input. Am I right or not? Just because the W by L of uh, M1 is so large, it has to be 50 times larger then it imposes a very high CGS. Now, any kind of circuit that you are trying to connect as an input should drive that huge capacitor. So that will take a lot of time if the driver doesn't have that much power to charge the capacitance. Am I right? Yeah. So that is a kind of uh, issue that I have. Is there any way that I can uh, reduce it? No, there is an RC, right? Because even if I have a resistance here, it's an RC. So a step input, a quick input, will then takes a very long time for me to charge this capacitor. Uh, yeah, that could possibly can do it, but still, C is very large. The C is so much large. Is achieving this 10 is, the, is the only way by which I can achieve is by W by L factor or is there anything else I can use it? Yeah, we can go for a VOE, right? Okay. So, in that case, I still have this GM1 by GM2, but what I would get is VOE2 by VOE1. Now, I want to have the same gain of 10. What am I supposed to do? Okay, so my VOE2 is supposed to be 10 times larger than the value of VOE1. Is there any problem with this? Huh? Uh, voltage supply, okay. Uh, let, let me give some simple example. So what I have here is that, let us assume that my VOE1 is basically around 2 point, sorry, uh, around 0.2 volt, okay? Now, how does it define my uh, VOV2? It translates to 2 volt. Say for example, you have a supply voltage of 3 volt, okay? Now, let me have uh, the, the VO. How will I define my Vout Q for this structure? What was my Vout Q? Yeah, VDD minus no, not VGH2. VGH2. VG, yes, yeah. So VGS2 is what we wanted. Now, having VOV2 as 2 volt, and let us assume that the VDH of a transistor is 0 0.7 volt. From here, what is the value that I would get here? VGS2 would then be defined as 2.7 volt. Am I right? 
Yeah. So over this graph, where this uh, Q point would then lie? Yeah. Rather than being at the center, I'm just pushing all the way because the three volt is my uh, uh, segment, and the Q point is actually flowing towards almost closer to 2.7, right? The Q point is shifted towards this particular node, towards the higher node. Now, over this node, when I try to have a swing, there is no problem with the bottom negative swing. But what happens is that the positive swing would then clip off. So, when I work with this VOV, the problem is that I, I move my Q points. Okay, that is a severe problem, right? So, I I cannot go ahead with the VOV. So, what I'm supposed to do is that I have to work with the WL factor. But when I work with the WL factor, the problem is that you end up having a very giant input device okay now is there any way that I can uh, get rid of this thing so in order to uh, have some sort of idea what I do is that I'll let us try to work out a simple example after working out that simple example we will motivate ourselves to get into the third uh, type of load which is current source load is that as clear this one yeah so in this case, uh, what I have assumed is that there, it is not really through this I can get my VOE expression uh, the, as, a, as a ratio. We know that the current ID1 is also equal to ID2. I want someone to ask that, but nobody had asked. Okay, So when to use W by L and when to use VOE, nobody had asked actually. Am I right? Am I right or wrong? Nobody had asked me like, when to use this VOV uh, expression and when to use W by L expression. Correct. It is nothing but uh, it's a pretty straightforward expression. We know that the, cur uh, the currents through both the device has to be equal. And if I assume that both my M1 and M2 are staying in saturation, I can just substitute half K in dash W by L of 1 VOV1 squared and then half K in dash for the top transfer. Say for example, I'm going with uh, with NMOS uh, direct connected, okay? So I just go with the same thing, W by L of 2 times VOV 2 square. So now, there are certain things we have to assume in order to get a particular answer. So the point is that, if at all, if I assume that the W by L of 1 is equal to W by L of 2, then the way that I get the gain expression is this, okay? But in case, if I assume my VOV 1 is equal to VOV 2, then the gain expression is supposed to be the square root of W by L of 1 divided by square root of W by L of 2. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, so there is something that I have to assume in order to get both these expressions. I cannot use both at the same time. So if I use one thing, I cannot use the other one. Was that, was that as clear? So when I assume that the VOEs are same, then I have to use this as my gain expression. When I assume that the W by L factors are same, then I have to use this gain expression. Okay, it is not that you can use both at the same time. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so in short, I want to want you people to derive the gain expression for this. Okay, so what type of expression I would end up having? Just the expressions. Yeah, so obviously as you said, the gain expression would be GM1 by GM2, right? Yeah, DC current source would become open circuit when I go for a uh, small signal model. So no need to worry about it. But is there, there is something, uh, of course, I have to add, yeah. So the current that is flowing through this M2 is not same as that of M1, okay? So use your knowledge appropriately to write down that, uh, use that expressions. Okay, so GM1 current is different and GM2 current is different. DC current, I'm telling. Uh, yeah, so I can write that uh, I1 or ID1 is equal to ID2 plus IS. But what is IS? It is 0.75 times that of ID1 or I1, right? So what current flows through uh, ID2 then? Yeah. So it varies then. 
which is very so is pawns are five times i1 yeah correct so like uh, if i1 varies even this way so it's uh, yeah. constant current so it's a no, 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 but we we are actually uh, fixing this uh, through vgsq okay. so i'm not varying this uh, input voltage okay. the only thing is yeah we will get multiply by four times i wanted that okay so the gain expression of this quantity gm1 by gm2 stays the same the only thing is that when i try to derive the expression of this gm1 and gm2 the currents through them are not same okay so i have to be bit careful in doing that so in the case if i'm using this expression of gm equals to square root of 2id uh, kn dash w by l so when i plug in this what happens is that so i just replace this id so for id1 it is equal to i1 but for id2 the current is replaced with i1 by 4 that's it okay and that is how this 4 has come at the top okay so in this case uh, the assumption was our vovs were taken as same and due to which i could write down this but what if if they are not equal what if i am doing the other way like uh, i am trying to impose that the w by l factors of both the devices are same in that case then the gain has to be returned as yeah minus vov 2 uh, by vov 1 and due to which it becomes uh, i think uh, yeah 4 has to come yeah okay so now in this case the requirement that is posed on this vov has got reduced so now that i am just asking for the gain to be equal to 10 so now What's supposed to be the value of VOE two in relation with my VOE one? It is enough to have just two point five times greater than that of my VOE one. Okay, so that is how I can uh, work with it. Okay, is that is making sense? It's just to give a way by which we can get rid of this error. Okay. Okay, so I'll stop here.